you guys coming out this afternoon. Uh, my name is Mike, uh, and uh, the folks that have helped me with this project are sitting up here in the front row, uh, Cecil Jones and his son, Chris Jones. And uh, we're going to talk about on-speed angle of attack maneuvering. It's really going to be some handling techniques. Uh, and if you are a person that likes to measure with a micrometer and a couple of lasers, I'd ask you to put those away and take out your good measuring thumb and your good cutting axe because we're going to be talking about a lot of rules of thumb and some generalities. And I would love to give you specifics, or I'd love to give you a device you can press one button and you can make all this happen. But unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. So welcome to experimental ideation. Um, today we're going to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about what on speed is, how to find it in your airplane. Uh, and we're going to talk about a positive feedback mechanism that allows you to hear your angle of attack, so you don't have to actually look at anything in the cockpit. And um, then we're going to discuss some rules of thumb, how you can fly the backside of the power curve uh, using your angle of attack, pretty much in lieu of airspeed. Uh, and then we'll talk about how to build a little tone generator if you're in a project like that. And then Cecil's going to talk about MGL avionics because they've already taken some of this logic and put it into their software system. So um, that's what we're going to talk about today. And like I said, this is, a, this is an informal discussion. This is all collaborative in nature. I'm confident there's somebody in the audience that's smarter than I am because there's more than two people in the room and I'm one of them. So uh, if you have anything to say or if there's a uh, mistake or I'm doing something wrong, just go ahead and raise the flag and we'll talk about it. And uh, I'm happy to answer the questions as we go along as well. So let's just start with what we mean by on-speed angle of attack. How many folks in the room have ever heard about the expression before, other than anything that we've been talking about here recently? Okay, great. Uh, because uh, this is not an original concept by any stretch of the imagination. But all on-speed angle of attack is, is the optimum angle of attack for maneuvering and approach. And we'll get into some academics in a little bit and we'll discuss why it's optimum for maneuvering, why it's optimum for approach. But that's really the crux of the whole thing. And it occurs when the wing is producing about 60% of its total lift capacity. And that's an important number for some of the rules of thumb we used to develop some of these techniques. So we'll get back and we'll circle back to that in academics as well. But why it's handy to know what on speed is, it's your optimum uh, angle of attack from an energy standpoint for a lot of things. If you're maneuvering relative to the aerodynamic limit, it's uh, V ref if you're coming in for approach and landing. It's always the same AOA, and that's really critical. And that will come up in the brief several different times, so that's the primary foot stopper. On speed angle of attack never changes. It automatically compensates for any changes in gross weight, it automatically compensates for density altitude changes. G load, everything. So it's the same. Once you get it dialed in, you don't have to make any uh, make any mental adjustments when you fly on speed. So the bottom line is what it does for you is it simplifies maneuvering. You understand where it is, how to find it, how to see it, how to listen to it in your airplane, and it's also going to improve your consistency, not only in maneuvering flight but in pattern operations as well. So we'll talk about that. And uh, I like to say that the indicated airspeed automatically varies whenever you maintain on speed, but it automatically varies because of the half hertz flight integration system up here that is either looking at or listening to the angle of attack and then making the stick do the right thing. So where's it been all this time? Well, you're gonna find out I'm an AOA zealot after we, we, we talk for a little bit, but uh, you know, I think the first historical evidence of discussion about airspeed versus AOA popped up in 1907. Uh, and it's been going on ever since. Uh, but uh, when uh, Orville and Wilbur were talking about the angle of incidents up there, that was an uh, archaic term, the angle of attack, or we're talking about it now, not what we consider to be angle of incidents. The military was the early adapter of the AOA system because it actually did work extremely well. Uh, and back in the 50s and 60s, they started to integrate it so that essentially all of the fixed wing airplanes flying now have some sort of angle of attack system. Uh, and even all the airliners and things like the Jedi Fly Orc has an angle of attack system, whether it's displayed in the pilot or not, all the information is obviously going into the flight management system. All right. <clears throat> Up until recently, though, there hasn't been a whole lot of discussion about angle of attack as far as civilian aviation goes because we haven't had an inexpensive angle of attack system. But back in the 60s, some folks developed something called the coefficient of pressure, and uh, that's the um, dual 
pedo inputs that you take either out on the wingtip or with a Garmin type pedo tube or a Dynan type pedo tube. And essentially, it's just measuring the differential between that pressure, which is constant, uh, as uh, the angle of attack changes. And then the other thing, we've been able to vary that out of the century technology now, so it's relatively inexpensive and easy to do all of this, whereas 30 years ago, it wasn't. So that's why we're starting to hear more and more about this. And there's a lot of good systems out there. There's a lot of projects underway right now. Uh, as far as innovation goes, and getting good energy management tools to the pilot. This is just one concept uh, on how to do that. And then the other thing is, I use the term energy a lot because of my background. Um, I was a flight instructor in college just in the Air Force, uh, where I flew little airplanes, uh, fighters, and um, we were heavily dependent on these concepts that we're going to talk about in this brief as far as how we train folks. So right now, I know that energy management is kind of a gray area for a lot of folks, so hopefully we can shed a little bit of light on that. And then the other thing is, most of us spend most of our time flying around one G. So we tend to get really good at the one G, but we don't think in terms of flying multiple Gs. Oh, absolutely. There we go. Is that better? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sorry about that. Hey, Matt, do you want me to switch sides for you? Would you? Brilliant. Okay. In the spirit of full disclosure, angle of attack is not the cure for cancer. Okay? It's not, I wish it were that simple. It's not. This is actually from an old Air Force report in 1972 regarding angle of attack. But the important part is what is underlined in red. Okay? What it allows you to do as a pilot is precisely figure out where you are relative to the aerodynamic limit of the airplane. We'll talk about that more. Uh, but that's what it brings to the fight if your airspeed indicator does it. So, how can I speed improve your flying? Well, most of the time, chances are if you don't fly aerobatics, you're flying an angle of attack a lot lower than on speed. However, every time you take off and land, that's actually a max performance maneuver, and it's kind of critical to understand what your energy state is when you take off and when you land. So, even if you don't think in terms of uh, flying a lot of aerobatics, speed can still help you, especially in the traffic pattern. Bottom line with flying on speed is if you maintain on speed, you actually can't stall the airplane. You can't depart control flight. And you're maintaining an optimum energy state. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that optimum energy state is. Okay? And again, it's not affected by your G-load, your attitude, your gross weight, your density altitude. So there's no math involved in any of this stuff. And if you do start to fly all attitudes or you're already an aerobatic pilot, you can fly on speed and that actually will help you. Uh, especially if you're learning how to do some of this stuff and you're learning what the different aerodynamic views of the airplane are, it's really very efficient as either an instructor or a student to be able to get some sort of positive feedback to know just exactly what your energy state is. So, we'll go through a few bit of the academics here. What I've done is I've condensed two years of pilot training into six slides or less. Okay, so bear with me. There's a lot of information in there. And if you have a question, just please ask, okay? And ask somebody in the room preferably smarter than you. So here we go. Everything you need to know about energy management in one slide or less, okay? Everything that's really important is in red. But because there's probably somebody in here that's a physics major, it's important that we all understand exactly what energy is. And all that is is power if it's a piston engine airplane or thrust if it's a jet engine that we convert into altitude and airspeed. So obviously we do that with our left hand or our right hand, whichever one happens to be attached to the body. And the total amount of energy that the airplane has available is directly dependent on the position of the throttle. We can add power to gain energy, and we can reduce power to lose energy, or we can add drag. And we can add drag with a high drag device. We can put flaps out. We can use some sort of a speed brake system or we can put some load on the airplane, some G on the airplane, because if we're flying two Gs, you're generating twice the lift that you would normally generate at one G, and you guys all remember from pilot training, if you generate lift, you're simultaneously generating drag. Okay? So really, if you only remember one thing from this slide, all you have to know is that energy is your altitude plus your airspeed. That's it. It's about that simple. And we're always constantly trading one of those for the other. 
If we're actually in stabilizing the level of flight and everything is balanced, we're not trading anything. But if we're maneuvering the airplane, if we're taking off, if we're landing, if we're turning, if we're doing aerobatics, we're constantly training one for the other. And everything in the bottom here is a little bit technical, but basically we roll the airplane to point the lift where we want the lift. And then we use the throttle to control the amount of power that we're going to have in the equation. And then we use pitch to add G to the airplane to control the amount of lift that we're producing and the amount of drag that we're producing. So how we manage all of those things is in fact energy management in a nutshell. And I totally get that that is one year's worth of pilot training. So all you need to remember is that energy is your altitude plus your airspeed. We always train one for the other. And most of the time, in everyday flying, we just do it with pitch changes. We do it with the elephant. And then the other thing we have to consider is that the airplane is always going to be limited. It's going to be limited either by aerodynamic limits, it's going to be limited by speed, or we're going to have some sort of a structural load. So, going back to pilot training, this is our VN diagram. I hope everybody here is familiar with the VN diagram. This is the VN diagram for my airplane. Uh, and uh, it's fairly typical. I have an RV4 for full disclosure. Uh, so if you have a first generation RV, this is actually your VN diagram too. So that's a RV3, a 4, or a 6. Uh, the 7 and the 8 and the 14 are different. Uh, but anyway, just a quick trip around the envelope to remind you of what we're up against when we're maneuvering. The left side of the envelope is the aerodynamic line. Okay, that's where the airplane stalls. And you guys probably remember from pilot training that that's a parabola because lift varies as the square of airspeed. So you're going to see that square and that square root a lot and some of the little rules of thumb that we're talking about. Across the top is the structural load limit of the airplane. So this is a 6G symmetric limit on this airplane. Um, because this is my airplane, I have asymmetric and symmetric limits. Dan does not specify asymmetric limits. Does everybody understand the difference between a symmetric and an asymmetric pole in an airplane? Okay, all right. In simplest terms, if it's a straight pull, it's a symmetric pull. I'm only maneuvering about one axis. So roll, set, pull. That's a symmetric pull. If I roll and pull simultaneously, that's an asymmetric pull. Okay, so a barrel roll is an example of an asymmetric pull. A snap roll that these guys fly out here, they're asymmetric maneuvers. Okay? And what asymmetric maneuvering does is it stresses the structure more than symmetric maneuvering does. So what the engineers do is they put a margin in, okay, and that margin is either specified by the side as they are, so it's a civilian airplane or no spec, it's a military airplane. And the FARs specify a 33% reduction for asymmetric. So 33% of 6 is 4. So if you have a 6G symmetric limit, then you have a 4G asymmetric limit. But again, Band doesn't specify any of this stuff, but that's just standard design practice. I the airplane, I get to set the G limits for the airplane. Okay. As far as the speed limits go, you have a structural speed limit. That's VNO, a maximum structural cruising speed. And then you have a dynamic speed limit, and that's VNE. Uh, and a little bit about VNE, are there any RV folks in the crowd besides me? Okay. Uh, all the RV ears. How do you think about VE? Is it an indicator of airspeed? Yes. Okay, it's equivalent, right? None of us are rocket surgeons, we can't do that, so it's really just true airspeed. So 200 container, 230 miles per hour, true airspeed is a great way to think of VNE. What about VNO though? Is VNO an indicated airspeed or is that a true airspeed? How do we think about VNO? The thing about VNO is an indicated airspeed, okay? It's always an indicated airspeed because it's actually based on a gust flow. So when the engineer builds the airplane and designs the airplane, he designs the airplane to a certain gust load. In the case of, uh, you know, a FAR 23 airplane, it's 50 feet per second. And again, man, doesn't specify that for RVs. But all airplanes have a certain design gust load. And you get a VNO or a maximum structural cruising speed based on that gust load. And that is always an indicator of airspeed. And then, probably one of the most important speeds on the diagram is maneuvering speed or quarter velocity. And maneuvering speed and quarter velocity are the exact same terms. Okay? They're interchangeable. 
and that is the minimum airspeed that you can pull the maximum G for the airplane. And if you care about the math, it's your stall speed times the square root of the load limit. So if you have a 6G airplane, that's about 2.45. And I looked that up actually on my iPhone before I gave the brief. I'm not that smart. Okay, but it's about 2.45 times whatever your indicated stall speed is. So that day, that is your maneuvering speed. And that's going to vary as a function of your gross weight. Okay? Next slide. All right, this slide is a, a whole lot easier on the eyes and we're getting the on speed concept. This is just a drag curve, a generic drag curve. A lot of the generic drag curve, remember your drag curve is a function of your induced drag plus your parasite drag. So the bottom of the drag curve or the low drag point is L over D max. Okay, and a lot of really good things happen at L over D max. Alright? That is where VY happens, for instance. Best rate of climb. By the way, it doesn't matter what altitude you're at, but like VY indicated airspeed. Okay. Um, what else happens at L over D max? Maximum endurance flight happens at L over D max. Maximum range flight happens at L over D max. Okay. And then we have the stall on the left side, everybody's familiar with that. And most folks have probably remember this from pilot training too. We talk about that left side of the brain the left side of the brain region of reverse command. And we do that because it actually takes more power to fly slower. Okay? So it's a lot like having a conversation with my wife, but nothing good happens in the region of reverse command unless you actually know what you're doing with the airplane because the airplane will continue to decelerate. So on speed, this magic number that we're talking about, is about halfway between L over max and the stall on the back side of the drag curve. And we'll get into that in a little bit more depth. But if you only remember one diagram from the whole brief, this is a great diagram to remember. So it's a big U with three stripes, and on speed is about halfway between the bottom of the U and where the airplane actually stalls. Next slide. Another way to look at that is we can put that exact same diagram on a VN diagram and we can look at it at any condition other than 1G, okay? So if you remember, the 1G line is that big black line going across the middle of the diagram there. So uh, you've got stall speed on the left, it's about 50 miles an hour for this particular airplane. Then you've got on speed, which is about 75 miles an hour for this airplane. And then you've got LV max, which is about 105 miles an hour for this airplane. But the neat thing about those numbers is they all go out with flight angle. So in 2G's, on speed is going to be faster than it is in 1G. And in 3G's, it's going to be faster still. Same thing is true for the aerodynamic limit. Did you guys remember that from doing accelerated stalls? If you have 80 miles an hour on the airplane, and then you stall the airplane, it's going to stall about 2G's versus stalling at 1G. It's your normal indicator of speed. So this is just simply another way of looking at that other diagram across the full flight envelope of the airplane. All right, this is the most tactically useless slide in this brief, okay? But a lot of folks will go, well, gee, that, what, what is an optimum turn, okay? And uh, there's a couple guys in here that I know recognize this diagram because this is how we teach young guys in the Air Force to think about how they manage turning their airplane when they're learning how to do that because when you fly fighters it isn't about aerobatics it's all about turn rate radius management and energy management that's it that's all you really care about okay so as we're teaching folks to fly we teach them about something called an instantaneous turn which is I bank the airplane up and I literally pull as hard as I can until I get a structural and aerodynamic limit or a sustained turn we know we can't sustain instantaneous turn the airspeed's going to continue to decrease. It's pretty logical that if you put your airplane into a 60 degree bank and you keep pulling, eventually it's going to stall, it's going to continue to decelerate no matter what speed you actually start that turn at. Okay? So all this is showing you is what that optimum turn is. So when I say that this on speed gives you optimum turn performance, what it allows you to do is fly this red line here. And this is just sustained turn. So for my mighty RV4, light nose, with a 160 horsepower engine at sea level, that's assuming I'm flying right at the top of the water. So it's hypothetical. I can maintain two and a half G's with that airplane at about 105 miles an hour, okay, if I max perform the airplane. If I pull any harder than that, or any more G's, the airplane's going to decelerate because now I'm off this red line and I move up to this black line. 
This black line is actually the aerodynamic limit on a VN diagram. So again, don't get too enamored with the slide, but if somebody wants to go to optimum turn is, okay, that's what an optimum turn is. So you don't even need to know that, but there you have it. This is also up here to appease the physics majors in the room, okay? And the only part of this equation that's important, this is just the coefficient of pressure equation that Bendix came up with back in the 1960s when they invented AOA systems that the Air Force put in their trainers, okay? And this is the same thing that Dynan uses, this is the same thing that NGL uses, this is the same algorithm that everybody that produces an angle of attack system using coefficient of pressure uses to display angle of attacks, okay? And the only thing that's important here is this last little part of the equation, one divided by your speed, divided by your skull speed squared, okay? And that's that little ratio at the end, and really all that is is VREF, okay? So everybody understands we fly VREF at about what? 1.3, right? Okay, so that's all that ratio is, okay? And that could be anything. That could be angle of attack in degrees, that could be airspeed in knots, that could be non-dimensional cockpit units. If you have an AOA system that just has a, a circle that's calibrated from one to 10, and they don't mean anything other than 10 is a skull and one is, okay? Next slide, please. So, long story short, everything you need to know about on speed is right here in red, okay? And on speed, for us, in our straight wing, propeller-driven airplanes is somewhere between 1.2 and 1.4 VS, okay? So if we were to experiment and start looking for on speed, where are we gonna look for it? Right in the middle at 1.3. And remember when I said that the wing was producing about 60% of its lift? We'll look at 1.3, if, if you plug that into your iPhone, and turn it sideways and turn it into a scientific uh, calculator, you'll see that that little equation works out to 0.591, which is about as close as you can get to 0.6. Now that doesn't mean that in your airplane that's going to be exactly right, but that's where you start looking for it. Because everybody's airplane is a little bit different. So I put just one quick practice drill up here, but if your airplane stalls at 63 and you do that math, you're going to find out if you plug it in here and here, it's going to be between about 75 and 82 miles an hour any day of the airspeed.
the, the stuff that we've put together is over on uh, Vans Air Force. If you have an RV and you're interested in some of this stuff, if you go to VansAirForce.org, you go over to the safety page up at the top, there's a yellow sticky, and you can see transition training materials in there, and all the work that we do, we post down there, and all this stuff is just available for download. Go ahead, sir. It's on the net. Is it .net? .net. I stand corrected. It's VansAirForce.net. Thank you, Mr. Okay. But this is the technically correct way to find on speed, which in a propeller driven airplane happens right here at max power. Okay? That's also VX, if you remember that from your pilot training. So this is VY and this is VX. Okay? And on speed occurs at VX. So if you can hear on speed, you can also apply VX. But the relationship between LRV max and max power is 32%. Okay, so if you know what your already max speed is, and there's some simple flight test techniques for figuring that out, you can subtract 32% from that, and that's going to be the heart of the on speed envelope. Okay? 32% faster, by the way, than already max is also Carson's number, so that 32% rule works both ways from that point. Next one. Alright, so the next question becomes well, what about flaps, back? Well, yeah, what about flaps? Okay. Um, if you remember from your pilot train, flaps actually affect the actual length of attack the airplane stalls at. Remember that? So if you put the flaps out, it stalls at a lower angle of attack, but a higher coefficient of lift, so we actually get more lifties. Alright? So that means technically if you have a system that displays angle of attack, on speed is going to vary depending on your flap position. Everybody with me so far? Alright? So the reason that I put this in light gray, and by the way, this whole briefing can be downloaded, and I'll, uh, anybody that wants it, just stop by after, and uh, we'll make sure that you get a copy of the But the reason I put it in gray is because um, the system that we have developed and we have put in RVs, we have found, you can actually find a single compromise setting that works really well um, for all your different flap settings. The other option is, if you have an angle of attack system, you have a flap sensor in your airplane. The flap sensor talks to the AOA system, and the AOA system is smart enough to know which data it's supposed to be looking at. A good example of that is the AFS system. I mean, it's been on the market for a long time, but it's a wonderful little computer. So if you have an AFS angle of attack, and you've got a flap sensor, it's capable of having multiple calibrations. Okay? But if you're just an experimenter like us, and you have a simple airplane like I do that has you know, two position manual flaps, and you have a just a you know a very simple set of avionics. This nice compromise works pretty well. So what you can see is what you want to do is you actually want to calibrate your system for the lowest angle of attack stall because you need this thing to work in a landing pattern. And then you accept that it's not going to be quite perfect when you're out in the area you're maneuvering. Okay. So the compromise between 1.3 and 1.2 is 1.25. So that becomes the sweet spot where you start looking for angle of attack if you don't want to put a flap sensor in your airplane. Next slide. Thank God. Okay. Next slide. So bottom line though is we have to calibrate. Okay. Unfortunately, none of this stuff comes free. I think some of the innovation that's coming out can make calibration a whole lot easier than it is right now. I'm not going to get into specifics. If anybody does want to talk about specifics, though, happy to email you. My email address is up over here, or come on up after and we can discuss it just a little bit. Okay? But how these systems all work, they're all calibrated very similar to what's depicted up on this slide. Okay? Um, they figure out about where zero lift is, and they figure out about where stall is, or some known point short of stall. Okay, so you might stall the airplane, you might back off 15% or whatever, and you establish a point here, and then you establish zero lift, and then if it's a straight wing, propeller driven airplane, the neat thing is, it's almost a straight line. So if you have those two flight test points, now your AOA system is calibrated. So they all have different techniques that they use for calibration. So you follow your manufacturer's techniques to calibrate the system, and then you can start looking for mod speed for there. But that's the basics of how all of these things are calibrated. And it doesn't matter if it's a coefficient of pressure, it doesn't matter if it's a vein, they all work the same way. Next slide. Okay, here is some actual flight test data from two of our airplanes. Okay, we've, we've only rung this out basically in RVs. 
Uh, but this is RV8. Obviously, he's got electric flaps, four different flap positions. Okay. And what this depicts is the angle of attack in the blue line, and then the airspeed in the red line. So obviously, as the angle of attack increases to stall, airspeed goes down. And that's it. flap zero, flaps 10, flaps 20, and flaps 40. So if we were going to look for the highest angle of attack, we'd want to look at the data up here at flaps 40. Okay. Now the neat thing about this test airplane is that you can see that stall occurs at just about 100%. So that makes the math real easy. Next slide, please. Angle of attack, our on speed is going to be right here on the 60% line. Next slide. Here's the head scratcher, okay? If anybody has first generation dining equipment in their airplane, come talk to me because we have tried this now in several different airplanes and the first generation equipment actually uses a different algorithm than the second generation equipment. So if you have first generation stuff, this is the best I could do, okay, after multiple attempts at calibration. So you can see that at flaps 40 in my airplane, the best I could do is about 87%. I couldn't get it up to 100%. So next slide. So that means that I had to start looking for on speed somewhere other than at 60%. But the neat thing is, is that 60% rule carries through everything. So what's 60% of about 80? That's it. So I start looking for on speed down here. And it turns out in my airplane, it's right around this region right in here that I haven't yelled. Okay. So that was all verified empirically after we did the math. So it took about three or four iterations of flight test to actually get on speed dialed in in my airplane. In the other airplane, you can see that it's a whole lot more logical because stall occurs at 100%. So if you have a system that lets you know that stall is occurring at 100%, the 60% rule is a lot easier to apply. But if you don't have that, it's okay because it's just 60% of whatever this maximum number is. Next slide. All right. This is the art of getting your AOA system dialed in. Okay. Unfortunately, there's no free lunch. I don't know any of the systems that works without being properly calibrated, and I don't know too many of them that work with just one calibration perfectly the first time. So it's just like everything else in experimental aviation, some flight test is required. Um, but the bottom line is, like I said, if you don't have a flat position indicator, just figure out what your indicated stall speed is, multiply by 1.25, and start looking four or five miles an hour on either side of that, and you are going to be very, very close. Okay? So we'll talk about some techniques we can do with some of the different systems out there uh, to actually just do this empirically. Alright? However, based on that test, like it says up here on the slide, it might be nice to bias that. It might be a little bit too slow. It might be a little bit too fast. Typically, it's a little bit too fast. Um, because one of the interesting things is if you're used to flying indicated airspeed and you start flying AOA, you're going to probably be surprised the first couple of times you come across the fence because you're actually going to be going, my God, I'm going too slow. Uh, but that's because you were carrying too much energy before. All right? I mean, in a perfect world, we land in elevated max, but it's really hard, for example, to land my airplane at 100 miles an hour indicated airspeed. So that just doesn't work. All right? So that's just something to consider is what your perception is as you start to experiment. So bottom line is some flight tests involved, there's a little bit of work and it does require a little bit of experience to get comfortable doing it, but once you do it and you learn to depend on it and you know that it's accurate for your airplane, it becomes pretty bulletproof. Next slide. All right. So what does OSPI look like? Well, this is just some different techniques you can use depending on what kind of system you have in your airplane, okay? Like I said, in a perfect world, if, you're, if your system has stall occurring at 100% lift, the 60% rule works like a champ. If it doesn't, some work required, but that's all this is. If you stall at 5% lift, just multiply Y by 0.6 and start looking for it there. Next slide. So this is what goes now if they consider to be a standard.
was the F4 was eminently confusing because all the lights were red, so you couldn't tell by just looking ahead actually read. Right? Uh, slightly slow donut with a chevron. Slow, it's just the uh, just the chevron. So if you have this indicator, I think uh, well, the Systems makes an indicator like this, and there's some other ones out there. You would calibrate it so that your 0.6 lift point would be right there, and that would be on speed. That would be your normal approach. Okay. That would also be on speed if you were upside down and you wanted to optimize your turn performance. Next slide. Okay, so here's an example of a graphic indicator. Okay, uh, and if you own dining equipment, you may find this graphic indicator familiar. Uh, MGL uses a similar graphic, but the important thing here is what you need to know is you need to know what values make what lights light up and make what sounds happen. Okay, not all the manufacturers provide that information. Okay, this is best guess built based on flight tests and some data gathering that we did uh, initially while we were developing the system because we didn't know how the dynamographic works because the information isn't available. So we had to go out and had to figure out what we think is the right answer. I don't know if this is 100% correct or not, but. For what we're going to do in here, which is just an exercise, it'll be fine. Okay. So the first step is you got to figure out what percent your airplane stalls at in whatever landing configuration you normally fly. Okay. So if that's flaps 30, it's flaps 30. If it's flaps 60, it's flaps 60. And then you need to know what percent lift. And if you have a EFIS, it's easy to know that because those those graphs I had on that other page were. Um, actually uh, generated from data that I downloaded from the EFIS. If you don't have an EFIS, a little harder to find some of that information, okay? Uh, but there are some uh, nifty systems out there, and I'm gonna have to pull one note out of my pocket here because I have a card. I uh, met a gentleman yesterday at breakfast that has got what I found to be a, uh, a really neat system, especially if you're a little bit limited in your capability to uh, download and flight test or I mean, download your flight test data from your airplane. Uh, but there's a system up here, and I'll, I'll keep the card out. It's called Cloudboy. Uh, and basically, it's a subscription service online, but all you need is a smartphone to make it work and a GPS. And you can come back and you can actually get a lot of good data out of your airplane that way. So if you don't have another way to download it from your EFIS, a tool like this might be uh, very valuable to you. So anyway, I'll leave that out. You know, uh, I should have put that up on the board. I apologize for that. The first step is to figure out what percent get that 60% number, okay? And then figure out what that looks like on your graphic, okay? So if you had this graphic and your airplane stalled at 100%, like our first test airplane did, you can see on speed is going to be the yellow chevron going through the V. So if only that part of the graphic is lit, then you know you're on speed. And we'll have an example in the next slide on how that works, okay? And then the last step is if your system has a progressive stall tone, you might want to figure out how that is met or how it works. I'm sorry, uh, and then apply that to this as well. Okay, so you may be able to listen to LRD max. You may be able to listen to on speed, and you may be able to listen to the stall. It just depends on how your system works. They're all just a little bit different. Okay, and the reason that the progressive stall tones I've learned from talking to some of the AOA pros that do this stuff for a living and build these systems is that AOA or I'm sorry, the FAA was you know, largely infatuated with indicated airspeed for a very long period of time. I think they're starting to finally come away from that, but everything is tied to stall speed and stall warning and things like that. So we end up with all these systems and they just reference progressive stall tone or something like that. And it's, it's largely due to the fact that some of these systems are designed basically to conform and appease to some of the concepts the FAA has about how they want their cause, their caution, uh, Warning system. Caution and warning systems. Thank you very much. It's Friday afternoon. I apologize. Next slide. Excellent. All right. So we figured out what that looks like, and if uh, if we had these options available to us for progressive stall warning tone, start at the yellow bottom. Okay. Well, that would be 50%. Well, that's about L3 max. So that's brilliant. So if I had this stall warning matrix. I'd probably start it here because I'd want to be able to hear LRD max and I want to be able to hear on speed. Now, if there's no change in tone, 
for this. Well, then I would go start yellow mid instead, and I would choose that, and when the tone came on, well, that would be on speed with this particular system. Next slide. So again, that's what it would look like graphically if all you had was just the graphics. On speed would look like this, slightly fast would look like that, fast would look like that. You certainly wouldn't want to see any green coming in to approach and land, okay? If you started to get slightly slow, or then slow, you probably wouldn't want to see three red chevrons. Basically, this would be where you would be flying for a normal approach and landing. From on speed to slightly fast, on speed to slightly slow. Next slide. Okay, so, because that's complicated, we came up with a way to just listen to your AOA. There's a lot of different oral cueing systems out there. Uh, I am a fan of something called positive feedback from a caution and warning system. In other words, I want the, the tone to actually tell me that something is happening. There are folks that think that the best way to do it is a null tone, which means that if everything is right, I don't hear anything, okay? Um, that will work fine in an approach and landing environment. It won't work quite as well in a high G maneuvering environment. And the reason is pretty simple. It's just because there's a lot going on in a high G maneuvering environment, and it's a lot simpler when you get positive feedback. Next slide. So we came up with this approach. Actually, we didn't come up with this approach. I stole this shamelessly from McDonnell Douglas. This was in the, uh, the F4 for years. Uh, the reason they put it in the F4 is because the guys in here that have flown it will tell you it, it doesn't handle well. It doesn't give you good aerodynamic cues. So we lost a lot of airplanes uh, early on. So they came up with a system that let the pilot listen to his angle of attack and prevent him from pulling back too hard on the pole at the wrong time, okay? So what's neat about this is you don't have to look at anything. There's no indicator even associated with this. It just simply is something you can listen to when you're flying an airplane. Next slide. That's it. Next slide. Okay. Don't spend too much time memorizing this. This is the tone pattern. It's just two different frequencies and a series of beeps, a solid tone, and some more beeps. And by listening to that, I know if I'm on speed, Slightly fast, fast, slow, or really slow, and I get a good skull warning. Next beat. Next slide, please. Thanks. So here's what it sounds like.
here's what it looks like under G. And the important thing to know here is look at what the uh, indicated airspeed does, which I hope is actually in this video. Go ahead. Take away this 
thing you want to take away from the brief, I have this slide up at the end too, but these are the rules of both thumb, okay? Associated with knowing where on speed is, okay? Like I said, if the AOA is stabilized, you can use it as a control indication to make pitch changes to your airplane. But during takeoff, best angle of climb is going to occur on speed, best rate of climb is going to occur at elevated max. And it doesn't matter what your weight is, it doesn't matter what your density altitude is, because it's an angle of attack, it's always the same. Okay? So if you want a max performance takeoff, you pull the airplane off on speed, and then once you clear whatever obstacles, and you accelerate, you accelerate out to LRV max, and then you climb at LRV max, if that's what you want to do. Okay? During maneuvering flight, you just start with a set of known parameters, you apply whatever your target G is, whether that's three or four Gs, and as soon as you hear on speed in the airplane, you catch it and you fly it. And then you decide what you want to do with your other airspeed and altitude parameter. But if you fly purely on speed, it will always keep you honest. Okay? And during approach and landing, you just simply fly on speed until it's time to start to flare. You slow down to slightly slow, and you either land in a slightly slow or slow tone, depending on whether you have conventional gear or nose All right? If you lose the engine, well, maximum endurance glide is going to happen on speed. That's your maximum hang time, right? The maximum range glide is going to occur at L over D max. So you can hear all of that. Next slide. So I have examples of all this. Um, in the interest of brevity, we'll watch takeoff real quick. This is short. Sure. And since we're accelerating, watch later the slow jump first.
good day. Okay, so that was I was able to maintain high speed perfectly throughout the traffic pattern. That doesn't typically happen. Okay, and my airplane has got a ridiculous glide ratio because it's got a fixed pitch prop on it, so um, I have to fly a bomber pattern with it. But uh, nevertheless. What I've got now is just a series of slides about what happens when things don't go right in the traffic pattern. So we're just going to step through these real quick, okay? Uh, one at a time, but basically demonstrating if uh, things don't go right, this is how the tone system helps you out.
uh, folks that have built these things that put them all in airplanes that are just like mine and have first generation dining equipment. So if anybody has second generation dining equipment in a garden or something like that, we'd love to help you build one. Next slide. And that's it. I'm going to turn it over to Cecil and he's going to talk about what we did with uh, NGL. NGL is a full up ecosystem. It has all sorts of digital analog as well as a built in uh, processing. So I built a, a, a test pitch example of a vane type AOA system. Uh, some aircraft, I mean, you don't want your, AO, your AOA sensors being in the prop glass coming off the engine. So if you have the way maybe a pusher aircraft, you use a vane type like a lot of big airliners have. You just build a little vane on a potentiometer with a very little resistance to it, run a voltage uh, through it and measure the output voltage as it varies as the vane moves, and you're writing that into an MGL digital analog input, and then you can program the system to, uh, once you calibrate it, to know what your angle of attack is. The uh, MGL also has the pressure differential on the back of the uh, uh, what we call the I-Box, and you can either use a Dynon type pitot tube that has a 45 degree offset inlet into the uh, pitot tube, or you can use a, a, a pressure differential which is somewhere between 15 and 40 percent of the core uh, recommendation I think we had for an RV6 was about six inches in front of where the uh, leading edge meets the uh, the main spar, the pressure port at the top, the pressure port at the bottom, run it into the top and plug it into your uh, IMOX differential input, and then you can uh, get the data you need to program the system to provide the OA. The way the system works is that you create a text file, you read that text file into the system, and you tell, that, tell the system that text file represents how you want your AOA to work. Parameters you can program into it, five parameters. The first one in the text file is frequency. Next is tone duration in milliseconds. Third is the pause between tones. Fourth is a repeat, repeat count up to a value of 10. Tone parameters will update at a rate of 8 hertz. And the five is the volume of attenuation. It starts off with a zero as the highest volume, and you can go down to a three. So you this is what the text file looks like. You can put in, uh, I think, uh, 38 parameters, and uh, you can have uh, 18 degrees at one half a degree per parameter.
So uh, any questions, ask that right now. Or you can the box. That's it. That just somehow Nigel started this whole thing a couple of years ago. No, I know it's not your fault. But we were we were discussing something in back channels, and I don't remember you. You brought up some point about AOA. I said, well, there's a way we can do that. And then I met these guys, and they were actually able to make this all happen. But if anybody's interested in building anything, please see us. We'd be happy to help you do that. Uh, and any resources. Anybody have any questions about anything? So besides all the explosions, sir. <laughs> I think we can because uh, a buddy of mine just bought an RV for the tax one, and I was looking at the uh, the diagrams, and there's a serial object in there. Okay. And do you have the Pro or do you have the Sport? I have the Pro. The Pro is fantastic. With the separate processor, it's not part of my. Right. My is so I Stay a... after the show if you, if you, if you want to build a box and test it for us. We'd be happy to do that with you. I'm going to get a hold of you. Got one right now. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Drop me an email then because we'll, we'll be happy to work with you because. Um, I know it can do it. I don't think the Sport gives you the same utility, and unfortunately, they're not the same computer. The Pro is a different computer than the Sport. Okay. So I think that um, the, the Pro is going to work like a champ. The Sport, I'm not sure about it. As long as we get the, uh, the, how the data breaks out on the serial nuts. Yep. Okay. Have you had the interest from, say, uh, Dyno to incorporate your time methodologies and options? But uh, you know the time they already have, like the Geiger counter, kind of time which goes. The the deal with the first generation stuff, Nigel, is that that, that software is all frozen. They, you know, with the SDC and everything else that they've got now, they said there's no way. It's like going breaking in the flight control system of the Viper. Not going to happen. Sure. Um, with the other advanced systems, don't know. You know, we have thrown this out to anybody that wants it. This is just purely a hobby project for us. We do it because we enjoy it. Um, we're not building anything <laughs> because we don't even have a small fortune, you know, to start with to make even smaller fortune in aviation. Plus, I don't know that there's even that many, you know, units that we could build that would be cost effective to do that. Uh, but we've talked to a couple other uh, folks here that uh, have expressed an interest in putting it in. So NGL is the first company to put it in as a pilot selectable mode, yeah. um, and uh, I think we're going to get a couple more that are going to do the same thing. Yeah, I mean, it's the same way you can have it. Tapes or the six pack, right? Exactly, because everybody's going to like something different. Yeah, you could you could have like you know standard stall tone or uh, you know your methodology, the great one to choose. Yeah. Yeah, MDL had in the basic tones a bit, you know, it says you're stalling or you're flying on speed or whatever. They didn't have the variable tone. So yeah. They'll go work with the programmer right here in South Africa and said this is what I want to be able to do. Yeah. He had a little uh, change in the software and said create this text file. Yeah, the hardest thing we had to do was all the data passes, because these guys actually rig a computer that could record the, the heat just real time yeah. and get it at, I think it's like about an 8 hertz rate or something where we're getting data. So I had to apply a whole bunch of different um, different profiles so that Chris could get all the data he needed to be able to actually write the code. Yeah. Uh, because from a pilot standpoint, it's caveman. You know, I mean, literally, I, I sit down on the computer, I plug this thing in, there's about five different values I have to change as a pilot. Uh, so as I go through flight test, I can change those values, but all the work was done by him uh, based on, you know, all the data. So I'm very comfortable that the system works exactly the way we intended to, yeah. based on everything that we've done. That's but, right, I really yeah. the uh, video together. Anybody have any other questions? Super. Easy crowd. It's a two-circle, great flight, your odd speed. No, no, you're on the fast one. Yeah, it's a one-circle. One circle you don't care, you go to the instantaneous oh, Yeah. Two circle you want the red line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in your RV, 2.5 G. No faster. RV4. Yeah, RV4. Seven's different. 